Reading from Esther chapter 7, the whole chapter. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And as they were drinking wine on that second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favour with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realising that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the words left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows 23 metres high stands by Haman's house. He had it made for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Thanks, Dave. I better reveal my glorious lockdown moustache uh, to you again. Thanks for having me again this week here at Forbes Baptist Church. It's great that I've been able to come and join you and share uh, the story of Esther. Uh, last week we looked at the book of Esther. We had a bit of fun retelling the story. And then looking into what it revealed to us about the sovereignty of God. It's interesting to note that whenever this topic comes up, we tend to struggle with how it meshes against our own sense of freedom and independence. It's a value which is common across much of the Western democratic, democratic world. And I wonder if we realise just how historically unique it is. And I guess nowhere is it more prominent than in the United States of America, the land of the free, which every year celebrates its Independence Day. You know, it's when they have lots of fireworks and they remember the signing of the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July in 1776. Amongst those present who signed the document was one John Witherspoon, a Scottish Presbyterian minister and the sole clergyman to sign the document. I'm sure many of you know much of the background of the story of the battle for independence, particularly if you've seen the Broadway musical Hamilton, which we were supposed to see in the last school holidays, but anyway, maybe one day we'll get there. Uh, Britain was headed by monarch George III, and he was imposing taxation on the citizens of the so-called New World. Many resented this as they weren't actually given representation in the British parliamentary system. Of course, of concern for Witherspoon was also the, uh, over, the overreach of the British in establishing control over the church in the American uh, continent. In May of that year, the American Congress appointed a day of prayer for the ensuring situation and Witherspoon preached a powerful sermon. Now, I've just realised I don't have a clicker to click through my PowerPoint slides, and I'm supposed to give them a signal. So if I, you see me doing this lots, shooter, that's the next slide. There we go. Thank you. Uh, where was I? So the Americans they appointed this day of prayer for the ensuring situation, and Witherspoon preached a powerful sermon. While politically influential, you can go back to me now, uh, his opening words are profound. For people whose greatest issue was whether to remain under the throne of Britain or pursue independence, 
Witherspoon saw an even greater issue at stake, a greater danger. But consider, I beseech you, the truly infinite importance of the salvation of your souls. Witherspoon called them to consider what's of greatest moment. While their minds are drawn to the pursuit of liberty now, there's a greater issue than their liberty at stake. And that was their standing before God. He pointed them to Christ saying, there is no salvation in any other. As I mentioned last week from our story, your relationship to the divine author of life matters. We will see that even more today as we delve deeper. Anyway, let's pray before we get back into the book of Esther. Father God, we just pray that as we open your word, you would challenge us, that you would help us to see your unfolding plan of salvation and to realise its important for importance for us that we would consider our standing before you and cast ourselves upon your mercy and the grace that you offer us in Christ Jesus we pray this in your name amen boys watching good okay you remember that last week I encourage you to read the story of Esther so you could just Flash the slide, then come back to me. It's all good. I encourage you to read the story of Esther for yourself. Having told the whole story in my first sermon, I'm going to assume that you're familiar with it this week. From Esther 4, we read these words, you remember. When Esther's words were repeated to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think because you are in the king's house, you alone of the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. We spoke about how Mordecai's words revealed that there is a divine purpose and that there is a divine author. He was a man of faith who knew his God. But then I guess that begs the question. If there's a divine purpose, what is it? And if there's a divine author, what is the story that he's unfolding? The hint is in the word Mordecai uses. Deliverance. It's an interesting word when you consider it. It can be used in a couple of different ways. We use the word deliver all the time when it comes to objects. Be it pizza, mail, something taken from one place to another. But we also use it with reference to people. Say, for example, I might uh, pick up one of Murray Brown's kids and deliver them to a church camp at Ridgecrest or something like that. More often, sometimes we'll also use it in relation to a state of being or a location. I might deliver someone from a boring conversation at a party or I might deliver them to the train station. In the second sense, it's a service. In the first, it's a rescue. But consider another option. I could deliver a felon into the hands of the police, into Ben's hands, for example. In this context, the word deliver conjures the image of judgment. But we understand what Mordecai means given the context, don't we? The Jewish people are facing extermination. They're in a place of danger and they're facing certain death. When Mordecai uses the word here, he's conjuring the image of rescue. They cannot rescue themselves and they need God's intervention to take them from a place of certain danger to a place of safety. That's the hope Mordecai has. The, this hope, though, it's not just wishful thinking on the part of Mordecai. Even though it has an un uncertainty as to the how or when, Mordecai is certain God will deliver. To understand why he thinks like he does, we're actually going to have to travel back in time. Stopping first at the book of Genesis. It's a passage I mentioned last week, and it's a scene in which Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. You'll be familiar with it because uh, you will have seen it recently in your sermon series. Do you recall Joseph's words? 
God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. And then again, God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. There's a few interesting things to note here. First, note the danger they faced. They were starving. They were facing certain death. Secondly, note the purpose. God has a plan to preserve a remnant. This is God working out and displaying his faithfulness to the promises of Abraham. You'll remember the promise of a great nation, a land of their own, and a blessing to all nations through them. Thirdly, note the outcome. When the brothers came begging to Egypt, I'm guessing they were just hoping for a meagre ration to return with, something that would just keep them alive. Little did they imagine that they would be greeted by their brother who held the keys to the storehouse and who would be able to provide them with food and security and land. What an extravagant salvation. But note the way in which it comes. You're familiar with the story. It's so unlikely. Notice that God is working towards their deliverance long before they even know they will need it. There's a similarity to the book of Esther here. The deliverance in the book of Esther is dependent on the position she holds in court relative to the king. Consider that she finds herself drawn in the position well before there is even a hint of danger to the Jews. In fact, given Haman's high position in the king's court, it, it's doubtful that anyone but Esther could have interceded or affected the outcome. God goes before preparing the way for deliverance. Now we're going to skip ahead a bit a few years from Joseph and find another unlikely character named Moses. He's standing before a burning bush and in Exodus 3 we read, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of a land, that land into a good and spacious land a land flowing with milk and honey. Once again, it's a story we're familiar with. It has purpose, again, tied to God's promises. But look at the extravagance of it. From slavery, no hope of walking away. Then we get through all the plagues to the Passover, where the blood of the lamb is painted on the doorpost, and it preserves the life of the firstborn in each Jewish household. Then there is the effective plunder of the Egyptians. They want the Jews out of there. They give them anything they can to, so that they leave. But then there is the hemming in by their enemies at the edge of the Red Sea. But miraculously, a path through the sea delivers them safely to the other side while their enemy flounders. Is it any wonder they sang songs of praise when they got to the other side? Just like Esther, this deliverance from their enemies is commemorated in, in an annual feast. In fact, the two are tied. In the book of Esther, the time at which the Jews find out that they've been sold to death is during Passover. Friends, while these stories are probably the most obvious cases... There's countless other stories that show God's faithfulness in delivering his people. But then there is another idea to this word deliverance. There are a few examples of it, particularly you find it in the Psalms. I'm only going to mention one of them in particular, Psalm 32. It's a psalm in which David feels the weight of sin. He acknowledges it before God. He confesses it and he finds forgiveness. You forgave the guilt of my sin, he says. 
You see, the danger David faces here is the consequence of being a sinner before God. He deserves to be delivered over to judgment. But instead, he receives mercy and is delivered from it. Later in that psalm, we read these beautiful words. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. God's plan of deliverance runs through the story of his people, Israel. But it cuts to the heart of every man. But we don't have time to linger here. As moving forward through our timeline, we come to a time when the kingdom of Judah falls. In the book of Isaiah, <coughs> we, are, we find that although warned, their unrepentance of God's people causes him to deliver them into the hands of their enemies. Judgment. They're into exile and they're scattered across what now becomes the Persian Empire as we find it in the book of Esther. This is where our story is set. So why, given that this judgment of God, can Mordecai still hope for deliverance? This brings us back to Isaiah. While it tells of judgment, it's very clear God has a plan for restoration. He is a remnant still to preserve. Incredibly, Mordecai would have already seen evidence of this, particularly in relation to specific promises that saw the pre, uh, one of the previous kings, King Cyrus, allow the Israelites to, determine, to return home, fulfilling a prophecy made 150 years before. But that's not all that is promised. In Isaiah 45, 17, we read that, but Israel will be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You will never be put to shame or disgrace to ages everlasting. There are other such promises too. Mordecai knows God is still working out his plan. His deliverance is certain. But now having looked at what Mordecai knows, I want us to consider the unlikely deliverance that actually unfolds in Esther. There is the danger. It comes from the pride and hatred of Haman. We might flash back to that slide at the end of this section, boys, so just hang on to that one. It comes from the pride and hatred of Haman. Being described as an Agite means he actually descends from the Amalekites, meaning this loathing is generations old. It goes back to the time of Saul, when um, Saul the Benjaminite fights with the Amalekites. Consequently, now we come to the time when Mordecai the Benjaminite is being pursued by an Amalekite. It's an age-old enemy of God's people rearing its head back up, a bit like the Hydra of Greek mythology. Evil intent bent on destruction. Notice the destruction is to be absolute. He's not just content with getting rid of Mordecai. His target is all of God's chosen people across the entire empire. He even casts a lot to determine the, the date for it, probably thinking that he's trying to find curry a bit of favour with the gods, making sure it's going to succeed. Notice that he schemes and plots to achieve his end. He actually has no authority on his own to do this. He buys his vengeance with silver, ensuring that consent is given. And even when this destruction is assured, it just can't come fast enough. He hastens to bring an end to Mordecai. His wrath finds particular focus on this one man. Hence the gallows or the pole which he erects. His wrath would find its focal point. Now consider the king in all of this. He has the power of life and death. He's bribed into handing the Jews over to death, but also led there with this deceptive tale of possible political instability. It's something we've already seen is a fear of his. He's not guiltless in this. This is why Esther really has to use a lot of tact. The reality is that 
he is the one who actually holds the power. But he kind of washes his hands of it. Then we come to Mordecai. I think we're meant to get the sense of a godly wise man. On one hand, he does honour the authority of the king. But he also commits civil disobedience by refusing to bow to Haman. I don't know if you noticed that. From the outside, we can tell this is actually an honourable thing he does. He almost seems to be this righteous figurehead for all of God's people in this story. He would be the first to die, bearing the disgrace of being hung on the pole. Jews in this story would understand the horror of this. To die in this way was to be accursed by God as we see in Deuteronomy 21. We get the feeling of injustice of this. Mordecai doesn't deserve to die. Now, I want us to briefly consider the weird outcome that happens in the middle of the story. The one plotted against, the one destined to die, the one we know is the good guy, is suddenly through a surprising turn of events paraded through the city like a king. If what we say is true, that God is working out his plan, what is the point of this event? It's really hard to say for certain. I mean, it could just be, in some ways, it's a source of humour, a way in which, in a sense, God is just mocking the counsel of these fools who plot. I want to be careful not to read too much into it. But I think there's something here in the fact that the one doomed to die is instead accorded the highest honour. The king just thinks he's rewarding Mordecai's service. But in fact, we see the full story and we get the situational significance here. But I'm going to leave it there for now. You can flash that other slide back up again now, boys, and you'll see that that's just what we've talked through. We're going to jump now to the events of our Bible reading. This is a pivotal point in the story of Esther. In fact, it's a pivotal point in the story of Jews, in the story of history. Prior to this dinner, doom for the Jews is assured. And there is a set of gallows waiting to take Mordecai's life. Esther is the most unlikely source of deliverance. Her influence is actually really limited, as we noted earlier, particularly being a woman. And remember that she's the wife of the king who ditched his last wife because she was just that little bit too headstrong. But she is courageous and resolute, even in the face of possible death. But consider the scene that unfolds. Esther dining with the king and the man who has sold her with silver to die. Patiently she waits until just the right time and she speaks. What happens next is nothing short of a miraculous reversal. In an instant the tables are turned and Haman knows it too. Facing death, he falls on the only one who he believes can actually deliver him. We find a broken man. He does not want to die. He pleads for his life, but it's no good. It's the will of his sovereign to crush him. And he would meet that end on the very gallows intended for Mordecai. It's an astounding substitution. Justice is served. In the place where Mordecai the righteous was to die, Haman the guilty man dies. Remember Deuteronomy? Cursed is the one who hangs on the tree. We see in this a remarkable salvation. Further, it paves the way for this incredible turn of events. By edict of the king, the Jews go from certain death to victors over their enemies. Certain defeat to victory. Deliverance had come. 
it's no wonder this became something that they would commemorate and remember from generation to generation. Mordecai was right. God had a purpose and he would deliver. But amazing as this is, the best was yet to come. God had promised in Isaiah that there would be an everlasting salvation. And as good as the story of Esther is, it's not the pinnacle of God's plan. But I think you'll see there are aspects of it that actually foreshadow it. Of course, it's obvious that I'm referring to the gospel, to the story of Jesus. Once again, God prepares the way. In a sense, this begins way back at the dawn of human history. But more specifically, with the opening of the gospel, we get the story of a child who is born to save the people from their sins, as we read in Matthew's gospel. He would be a deliverer. He's born at a time when there's another empire ruling over God's people, the Romans. He's born to Mary, betrothed to Joseph, chosen by God for such a time as this. The divine author working through ordinary people to bring about his deliverance. But Jesus was no ordinary child. We're told he's God with us. We have the account of his life, his teaching, his healing, his speaking of God's kingdom. We see that he is righteous and good. But also, he has ruffled a few feathers. We see this collective of enemies growing, ironically, among the spiritual leaders of Israel. As he challenges them, we see this growing resentment and hatred. But then this unusual event occurs. Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, and the people treat him like royalty. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, they shout. It's a spontaneous and surprising twist in the story. Jesus suddenly lauded as king. And you must ask, why? Once again, I think we see in this event that God is in control. Jesus himself says that if the people were to stay silent, the rocks themselves would actually cry out. It's God's intention to show the one on whom his favour rests. This event only intensifies the angst of his enemies. And before long, this turns to scheming and plots. They resolve to kill, but they have a problem. They're under Roman rule. They have no authority of their own under which to act. So they develop a scheme it involves a betrayal by a friend. For the price of 30 pieces of silver, Judas delivers Jesus into the hands of those who would have him killed. And in fact, the night he chooses to act is the night he dines with Jesus. Jesus, knowing what was to come, like Haman, understood the horror of what was before him. And he appealed to the only authority who could affect the outcome. But whereas Haman was led away in terror, not willing to submit to his sovereign, Jesus is very different. He pleads for another way, but he submits to God's will. It's followed by an arrest and a contrived trial with a predetermined guilty outcome. But the authority to execute the sentence of death rests with the Roman rulers, not with the Jews who wanted it. Brought before them, they can't find a reason for it. But this Roman ruler is worried about political instability, aren't they all? He offers to release Jesus, as it was the custom at Passover to grant clemency. But instead, we have a sudden substitution that almost cements Jesus' fate. The criminal Barabbas walks free while the innocent Jesus stands condemned. 
The Roman rulers try to wash their hands of the situation, but in so doing, they hand Jesus over to his fate. We should see that something seems dreadfully wrong. Where is the God of Esther and Mordecai who works his plan to deliver? This is not how it should look. The guilty goes free while the righteous is condemned. And so Jesus hung on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Deuteronomy chapter 21. Anyone hung on the tree is under God's curse. This verse seems so appropriate when we applied it to Haman. But here, at the cross of Christ, sometimes we do not rightly perceive the danger. You see, we can look at the story of Christ and sometimes the enemy looks like the Jewish leaders or the Roman authorities or the raging mob. You see, it's easy to get excited about the deliverance we see in Esther. The danger is just so tangible and evident. We understand the immediate danger to life. It's what makes the reversal so profound and the rescue so absolute. But that is not the danger that Christ is delivering us from. We see it mentioned at his birth. He would be called Jesus because he would save us from our sins. Now, sometimes that just rolls off our tongues too easily without thinking about what it means. Galatians 3.13 tells us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written, everyone who is hung on the tree is cursed. The curse of death is what we deserve. He willingly dies in our place so that we might go free from death. There is the great deliverance. There is the great reversal. In Acts 2, 23, 24, we're told, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Friends, he is the God of Esther working out his divine plan to deliver. Death could, did not win. It could not hold him. In Romans 4.25, it, it said, He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. It is the deliverance from sin which was known by David and it's foreshadowed in the psalm that I mentioned earlier. In ancient Greek mythology, there's a well-known tale. It inspired a well-known opera of Orpheus and the Underworld. More recently, a Broadway musical known as Town, full of lots of great music. I'd love to be in it or part of it one day maybe. But the tale is this about the son of a muse called Orpheus. He's a musician and a poet. The woman he loves, Eurydice, dies. And she goes to the place where all souls go, the place of the dead, where no one ever escapes. The souls there are the property of Hades, the god of the underworld. Orpheus, for love of her, journeys far and deep until eventually driven by love, he finds his way into the underworld. He wants to rescue Eurydice. Hades holds fast the souls he claims, and he does not want to release her. But, to cut a very long story short, he eventually agrees to let her go. But, on the condition that they walk out of Hades in single file, Orpheus in front, Eurydice behind. Orpheus, they're, they're not even allowed to communicate. If Orpheus once turns to look behind, Eurydice will, be in that instant, be snatched back to Hades for eternity. Orpheus nearly makes it. But driven mad by doubt, at the very last, he turns to look briefly to see Eurydice before she is snatched back to the clutches of death. 
You see, we know that death is absolute. You do not walk out of it. The Bible tells us it's a consequence of sin, a judgment, and those held by it are rightly claimed by it. It's a danger we face from which no mere man can rescue us. But Jesus is not a mere man. He's the one death cannot rightly claim. Marvel upon marvel, he walks into death for the love of those who don't deserve it, to redeem and rescue them. He takes on the judgment they deserve. But this righteous man is vindicated by God, the first to be able to walk out of death, claiming the keys to death and Hades. More than that, he's able to lead out a whole host of those who are held in its grip. From across the length and breadth of human history. Friends, we might delight in the story of Joseph with God's foresight and provision to preserve his people. You may marvel at Moses leading a nation out across the Red Sea. You may be awestruck by Esther and the great reversal from death to life. But all of these are merely foreshadowing God's greater plan of redemption and deliverance found in Jesus and his death and resurrection. But where do you stand here this morning? Have you put your hope and trust in the one who delivers? We, like Eurydice, are called to follow. He will not fail us. In John 8, verse 12, we read, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This draws me back to my opening story. The people of John Witherspoon's day thought their greatest danger was a haughty dictatorial monarch and their greatest need, deliverance from British tyranny to freedom. Perhaps today you might think your greatest danger is COVID. Perhaps you might think it's China or Iran or the Taliban. Maybe you think it's the current cultural revolution. I'm not saying that any of these things aren't concerns. They are. But in the words of John Witherspoon, consider, I beseech you, you, the truly infinite importance of the salvation of your souls. I encourage you today, consider the salvation offered through Jesus. Talk to him in prayer. Yield your soul into the hands of the only one who can truly redeem you and deliver you from the grip of death. If you want to talk more about it, seek out one of the elders or the leaders in your church here or someone you know who's a Christian around you. Talk to them about it. Don't delay. The danger is real. But so is the life and hope and true freedom that Jesus offers. For those of us that do follow Jesus, I hope you've caught a glimpse again of our God as deliverer. Marvel at his deliverance today. Praise him for it. And point others to it, that they may know what true freedom is. Let's pray. Lord God, you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. We thank you for the victory claimed by Christ over death. That you have delivered us from death to life. We pray now that we would remember that hope, that we would point others to it, and we would rejoice in it today. We pray this in your name. Amen.
We're going to uh, close in singing a song that reflects on God as our Redeemer, our Rock and our Redeemer. Thank you.